good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, uh, we are coming to the next session on bronchiectasis uh, today i have this pleasant task of chairing uh, this session this topic is uh, very dear and near to us all of us who are practicing pulmonary medicine in this part of this part of the world uh, today have we have three very esteemed speakers uh, who are speaking on uh, practical management and strategies of deteriorating bronchiectasis patient. Uh, it's uh, Professor Michael Lobinger. And the next uh, one will be micro, mycobacterial pulmonary disease, the challenge of diagnosis and treatment by Dr. William Flight. And then uh, finally, we have bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka, benchmark to improve quality of care by Dr. Dilesh Awad Singh. Uh, I, uh, the first speaker will be Professor Michael Lobinger. He's Professor Michael Lobinger is a consultant respiratory physician at the Royal Brompton Hospital. He has a specialist interest in respiratory infections, bronchiectasis and non-tuberculous mycobacteria and leads the respiratory infection service. He co-chaired the British Thoracic Society Bronchiectasis Guidelines and co-wrote the BTS, NTM and European Respiratory Society Bronchiectasis Guidelines. He's a founding member of the UK and European Clinical and Research Bronchiectasis and NTM Networks and leads global multicenter clinical trials. He chaired the Infection Special Advisory Group for BTS from 2013 to 2016, was secretary there from 2017 to 2020, as he's presently chair from 2020 of the ERS Respiratory Infection Group. He was awarded Professor of Practice Respiratory Medicine at Imperial College in 2018 and supervises PhD, MSc and medical students. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Lobinger for the lecture. Professor Lobinger. Hello, I'm Michael Lobinger from the Royal Brompton Hospital in um, the United Kingdom and also Imperial College. Um, and I'm delighted uh, to be able to uh, speak to you about uh, bronchiectasis today. Unfortunately, uh, I can't be there in person. Uh, what I'm going to talk about over the next 20, 25 minutes or so is, um, uh, is focusing on the management of bronchiectasis with uh, some of the data and evidence behind it, but also have a, a real practical edge to the talk and look at uh, strategies for the deteriorating patient. And I'm gonna pepper uh, the talk and illustrate a lot of the things that I want to talk about with um, some case histories. So I'm gonna start with talking about background, then talk about some of the evidence and the management uh, for that evidence before moving on, as I mentioned, to the deteriorating patient and some uh, cases and, and practical tips. So as you all know, bronchiectasis is, um, is uh, irreversible dilatation of the airways. And this is um, defined uh, originally by bronchograms that you can see uh, there with dilatation, uh, but now by uh, cross-sectional imaging. And as you can see, uh, the definition is of these enlarged um, airways. And clinically, this manifests as cough, sputum production, and recurrent exacerbations. Now, how common is it? And certainly a decade ago, uh, when there was less research and less interest in bronchiectasis, this was thought to be about 50 per 100,000 patients following a study um, looking at uh, health insurance um, data from the US. However, more recently, actually this figure is thought to be much higher and looking at general practice databases in the UK, it's thought to be up to 10 times higher than that. So 500 per 100,000 and higher um, in the older age groups. And that increase of uh, um, prevalence has really made, put bronchiectasis on the map with regards to respiratory medicine and both academic and industry interest. But as well as um, uh, being quite common, it, there's also a significant morbidity and mortality associated with it. This is quite an old audit type um, uh, study, uh, which I, I quite like to show because it really illustrates um, the healthcare burden. So in this study, they just looked at 100 patients over six months, and those 100 patients with bronchiectasis generated 321 clinic attendances. 
And um, the health insurance data paper that I mentioned before also showed that, that there's a significant health cost burden with uh, patients with bronchiectus having greater inpatient stay and annual cost per patient than other chronic diseases with congestive cardiac failure and diabetes mentioned. This is uh, some data from the Embark registry. This is a, a successful European registry with over 15,000 patients within it now in over 40 countries in Europe and has uh, also spawned um, similar um, sister registries, both in Australia um, and in India. And this is really just to highlight that um, there's significant numbers of patients, both with hospital admissions um, and uh, exacerbations um, uh, throughout a year. In addition to the individual morbidity um, and healthcare morbidity, there's also um, some mortality uh, associated with bronchiectasis. We did a study ourselves looking at uh, patients and showing a 12 year survival being about 68% um, and um, similar studies have, uh, have put it um, uh, similar kind of values. And interestingly, uh, a study in the UK suggested that mortality was increasing in 2010. So, Hopefully that's really set the scene and showed you that bronchiectasis is important from an epidemiological point of view, both from a numbers point of view, but also from a, a burden of disease point of view. So I think when talking about management and treatment and, and, and um, the different causes of bronchiectasis, it's really uh, quite good to, to look back at the original vicious cycle um, model of uh, infection and inflammation in bronchiectasis that Peter Cole, uh, my predecessor's predecessor, put forward um, several decades ago now, but has really stood the test of time. And this suggests that there's a combination of impaired lung defenses, which can cause increased microbial infection, inflammation, tissue damage, and you can go round and round um, in this in infection and inflammation cycle. And different causes of bronchiectasis um, can, can enter at various different types. So this was uh, an audit of our own practice um, several years ago now, and you can see um, different causes um, on the screen. And so just to pick out a couple, for example, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia or cystic fibrosis can lead to impaired mucociliary transport, impaired uh, lung defenses, and you can enter the cycle at that point. Um, other things such as ABPA, um, ulcerative colitis can cause an increase in inflammation entering the cycle at this point. Microbial infections such as TB can, can enter at this point and so on and so forth. There have been various iterations of this cycle and, and um, some studies suggesting that, um, or, um, that, that there's lots of interactions between those and, and, and perhaps a vicious vortex rather than a vicious cycle. But the principle of this remains. So when talking about management, it's worthwhile um, having this in the corner really to, to look at how management can interrupt these uh, vicious cycle areas. The first and important thing with regards to management is to treat the underlying cause. Um, this is um, important um, because different um, causes can, can lead to, to different treatments and examples of that are ABPA or ulcerative colitis where steroid treatment is more important um, or immune deficiency um, where um, immunoglobulin replacement may be the important thing to do. After that, if you look at different areas of the cycle, it can, it can help determine types of management. So impaired lung defenses or when mucociliary clearance isn't good, then physiotherapy, so helping get rid of the mucus can be an important part of treatment. And there has been various adjuncts that have been looked at with regards to that, such as mucolytics, DNAs, mannitol, uh, hypertonic um, saline, and DNAs was found to um, actually worsen um, outcomes in, in, in the group of patients that were studied. Manitol um, had, um, had inconsistent results and similar um, so far with hypertonic saline with small studies with varied results. There is a study going on at the moment looking at the impact of either carbocysteine or hypertonic saline or a combination of the two. So moving on to try and reduce microbial infection at the part of the vicious cycle to try and uh, reduce inflammation, tissue damage, etc. cetera. Um, these um, have um, some um, data that, that suggests it may be useful. This is an old paper now looking at how antibiotics can um, reduce neutrophil elastase or can uh, reduce um, um, inflammation. And you can see there that at 14 days of antibiotics, um, it can significantly reduce inflammation from an exacerbation 
but also in the stable state as well. And that's really the basis and um, some data to, 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 to help uh, confirm the vicious cycle um, as to why long-term antibiotics may be used. And these can either be nebulized antibiotics or oral antibiotics. And some oral antibiotics also may have an anti-inflammatory um, uh, part of their uh, management or, or, or mode of action. And cyclical intravenous antibiotics are, are the third type of long, long type of antibiotics. So I mentioned those antibiotics that can reduce the microbial number, but can also have an effect on inflammation. And macrolides are, are, are the main one of this. And there were three studies um, that, that came out relatively close together, one in um, Lancet uh, with the other uh, two in, in JAMA. And they all with slightly different entry criteria showed pretty similar things with regards to a reduction in um, exacerbation rates um, over the year um, for uh, long-term treatment with macrolides. Long-term inhaled um, treatment, the evidence for that and the studies for that have had relatively less um, success. Um, col colomycin, colistin, um, which uh, is um, certainly used a lot in um, our country, um, showed a reduction in the per protocol uh, population for exacerbations, but not in the intention to treat uh, analysis in a phase two um, population. But I have um, recently this year um, seen uh, some data that was um, shown at the European Respiratory Society to show that one of the phase three studies um, did um, reach their primary endpoint of a reduction of exacerbations um, for, for that. And hence, um, this um, may, if it's repeated in another phase three study, lead to another licensed product. Um, other studies have, have shown mixed results. So ASLI um, used, um, so that's inhaled um, astrianam on a month on month off cycle, um, used uh, quality of life um, as an endpoint and um, didn't meet that primary endpoint. There was a smaller phase two study of gentamicin, which did have some um, positive results. Other phase three studies include um, ciprofloxacin, um, as a nebulizer dual release and also ciprofloxacin as a dry powder. Both of these in the, um, in the dual phase three study showed inconsistent results. And finally, in a phase two study, um, the use of Toby Podhaler um, showed um, significant reduction in um, colony forming units, but wasn't uh, powered um, for any uh, clinical endpoints. So we've got some positive data, obviously, from uh, macrolides, and although hopefully there's going to be some uh, positive data now coming through with inhaled antibiotics, the story with inhaled antibiotics so far have shown um, some difficulties with regards um, to uh, primary endpoint um, uh, meeting, and a lot of that is probably due to either endpoint um, definitions or endpoint um, selection, but also the heterogeneity of the bronchiectasis patients. And that's not something I've mentioned at this point, but um, it, it probably is worth mentioning that bronchiectasis obviously defines a CT result. So it defines um, damage to the airways, but clearly um, there's quite a lot of different endotypes um, and patients that fit within that um, end result. Um, of patients and etiology is obviously one area um, where you can see very different causes of the bronchiectasis, but there's lots of other areas which are being looked at now, other endotypes. So they can be defined either by um, the uh, predominant um, cell types, so either a neutrophilic inflammation and the eosinophilic inflammation. They can be defined by what grows in the sputum, so pseudomonas patients or non-pseudomonas patients. But whatever way clearly having a group of heterogeneous patients may not be the best way um, to lump them all together in order to prove things by clinical trials or in fact um, management. So what about, um, what about going around the vicious cycle? What about an anti-inflammatory um, reduction? So um, here there's a New England Journal paper um, actually which showed that the DPP-1 inhibitor which um, results in um, uh, stopping maturation of uh, neutrophils in the bone marrow um, caused a significant reduction in exacerbation um, rates. And um, this um, really is likely to open up the whole field of anti-inflammatory agents such as that as a possible long-term treatment in bronchiectasis. Uh, 
So moving on now, that's really just to give a background of um, bronchiectasis management and pathogenesis and uh, epidemiology. But I want to spend um, the last sort of 10 minutes or so, so really um, getting more practical in nature and how I manage um, my, my patients here. Um, and I think it's worth illustrating this, thinking about patients that deteriorate. So patients that have um, significant or prolonged deterioration, increased frequency or severity of exacerbations, frequent hospital admissions, early relapses after treatment or rapid decline in lung function or deteriorating radiology. So really the difficult patients, what do you do with these bronchiectasis patients? So let, let's highlight that and, and, and start with case number one of this. So this was a 20 year old uh, female who, as well as a child, developed cough and sputum at the age of 14 and was referred to a local hospital at 17 with a CT scan showing lingular and low low bronchiectasis. And actually, in view of that, she went ahead and had a left low lobe lobectomy and lingular lobectomy and was well for, for a while, but she relapsed a few months later and she started getting the same symptoms that she had before. Um, she had a repeat CT scan, which showed the development of bronchiectasis in new areas now in the right middle lobe. And she was then referred to our center. So we made sure that we looked for an underlying cause. And uh, one of the things that we did is we looked at uh, her Im immunology and um, this showed that she had common variable immunodeficiency with um, very low IgG, A and M. And um, to begin with, we put her on um, macrolide uh, prophylaxis, and then we started her on intravenous immunoglobulin and discontinued the azithromycin when her trough IgG was 7.2. And she did really well. And this is to highlight that in all of these patients, you really need to be, in, be sure that you know the underlying diagnosis, and it's worth checking these things again um, if people deteriorate. So let's move on to case two, another deteriorating patient. So this is a 63-year-old um, female um, who uh, had uh, asthma as a child, developed cough and sputum in the late 40s. Bronchitis was diagnosed in 2009, which was uh, termed idiopathic after a review of um, all the etiological screens at that time. Uh, she grew pseudomonas, but was relatively stable with one to two infections a year. She then started to deteriorate over the last couple of years, more sputum, more shortness of breath, more infections, limited effect of antibiotics. And as you can see, we had a look again at possible etiological um, changes and um, looked again at ABPA. And you can see that her deterioration is reflected in a very high IgE level. And actually her bronchitis was getting worse because she developed ABPA on top of the bronchitis. She was treated with steroids, and uh, as you can see, her numbers came down nicely, and she also improved very well on top of that. So case two is an additional etiology or an additional diagnosis on top of what you've already been treating. Moving on to case three now. This is a 78-year-old female, well as a child and a young adult, um, <laughs> eight-year history of productive cough, six infections a year, so pretty severe. Widespread bronchiectasis on the CT scan. Host defense screen was unremarkable. A few reflux symptoms. And so what we did here is we put the patient on a PPI. We optimized the physiotherapy and we um, gave some positive pressure physiotherapy, some acapella, hypotonic saline. And there was a significant improvement, both symptomatically, but also radiologically, as you can see. And so here, what we did is optimization. And the final case is case four. Um, this is a 53-year-old female who we knew what the underlying diagnosis was. It was primary ciliary dyskinesia. Um, there'd been some deterioration since the age of 40 with multiple infections and pseudomonas growth. We had tried to get rid of pseudomonas with eradication, but this had been unsuccessful. And so we put this patient on nebulized colomycin. There was some stabilization, but continued increased infections. So we then increased her physiotherapy, and we also added azithromycin, so two prophylactic antibiotics. Despite that, she still um, was not doing particularly well, and hence we um, decided actually to start admitting her for um, what we call cycles of intravenous therapy every year. Um, we would bring them in for 10 days at a time every sort of two to three months, depending on their clinical um, improvement. Um, it, we also ensured that the anxiety and depression uh, was assessed and, um, and um, uh, optimized the rest of the management. So. Case four is additional therapies. So here we were giving additional antibiotics, optimizing everything, and then in fact going to cyclical antibiotics. 
And this really highlights all the different things that you need to assess in the deteriorating patient. So in a deteriorating patient, we would ensure that we do an HRCT, spirometry, saturations, ensure that we've reassessed the underlying um, uh, etiology, and then think, is there something new? So think about a new microbe, Pseudomonas, NTM, Aspergillus. Is there a new comorbidity here? Is it something completely different, Pul uh, uh, pulmonary embolus? Is there AVPA? aspiration, pulmonary hypertension, we think about all these things, or is there a completely alternative diagnosis? And if we've gone past all of those, and it is just their bronchiectasis that's worsening with no new etiologies or underlying problems, then can we optimize anything? Physiotherapy is really important. Are they compliant? Can we change the technique? Do they need adjuncts? What about pulmonary rehabilitation? And what about their baseline therapy? Is it, um, are they complying with it if they're already on um, antibiotics, for example? And is it appropriate? And then to think about exacerbation therapy. So sometimes we have patients that are having repeated exacerbations, but when you speak to them, they're only taking amoxicillin or uh, things like that for five days. And we need to ensure that they have a suitable antibiotic for the microbe that they're growing, a suitable dose and a suitable length of treatment. And that's really highlighted, this comes straight from the British Thoracic uh, Society guidelines in 2019, and I won't go through this table, it's just really to signpost it, it's there, and um, a lot of what I've mentioned and, and talked about um, is really put into these three um, flow, flow charts here, so assessment, optimization, and further management. And this is my practical management. This is actually something that I that I wrote in, in an article uh, 14 or 15 years ago now, but a lot of it is still relevant. So in, in the deteriorating patient or patient not doing well, if the management is otherwise optimal and they've got frequent oral antibiotics or frequent hospital admissions, ensure that you do that check. Um, if there's an alternative diagnosis, then treat appropriately. If there isn't, then think about long-term antibiotics. And for me at the moment, I, if it's pseudomonas, consider colomycin um, or azithromycin. Um, if it's not pseudomonas, then I think about azithromycin um, and then doxycycline or gentamicin nebulizers, even though um, there isn't a great deal of evidence with all of these things. I ensure that people that I put on long-term antibiotics, I uh, review two to three uh, months. Um, I'm not sure that, that I would use pulmonary function tests as, as the main um, uh, um, endpoint here. I would normally have a look at clinical um, responses. And we sometimes think about breaks of long-term antibiotics. How long to go on for uh, is always difficult once you've put somebody on. But if somebody's been stable for a year or so, then I think about um, the possibility of, of, of coming off for a period. What about long-term monitoring? Well, sputum cultures are, are important, um, particularly to, to ensure that there's no bugs that grow, um, that are new uh, within, within, within the period that you're monitoring the patient. Uh, spirometry, we, we often do on an annual basis and physiotherapy review uh, when needed. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, hopefully, I've given you a bit of background um, with regards to bronchiectasis and persuaded you that it's important. I've gone through the, um, the evidence for the various treatments at the moment, but also talked about things um, that may be on the horizon, particularly anti-inflammatory uh, agents and also treating um, endotypes of uh, particular patients. And then I've talked a bit about the deteriorating patient with regards to the importance of assessment, optimization, and further therapies. So hopefully I'll be around um, for uh, questions if it all works well. And um, I hope that that was the kind of thing you were wanting and helpful. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Lobinger, for that excellent uh, uh, lecture on bronchiectasis management. Uh, I would uh, like to ask you a few questions. Uh, now, we know when the patients are deteriorating, uh, they come get repeated admissions, their sputum production is high, uh, and they see, get sick often. But there are patients, uh, bronchiectatic patients who deteriorate very subtle way without much, uh, uh, much clinical evidence of uh, deterioration. Uh, do you have, what, what measures do you think are the best ways to detect these patients? Do you do repeat uh, CT scans on them or any other measures that you use to detect these people, these people who deteriorate very slowly? <laughs> 
Thanks very much, and, and thanks for the question. And and yeah, and that just sort of highlights the heterogeneous nature of the patients and, and, and bronchiectasis as a whole. Obviously, with people that are deteriorating very slowly, it's very difficult because you may not do um, very much in the way of, uh, of further investigations. What, what I tend to do, certainly when I was seeing patients face to face, is all patients would have at least an annual review. And in an annual review, I would ensure that I sent an up-to-date sputum culture and I think that's really important. I think looking for changes in the sputum, so particularly pseudomonas acquisition or non-tuberculous mycobacteria um, acquisition, that may be the signal that you know things aren't going as well and that may be um, the, the lever to to, to get an up-to-date CT scan. Um, other than that, you're essentially reliant on you know, the sputum culture spirometry I would normally do it within a clinic appointment and um, and the patient's history and uh, and uh, w what they describe with regards to exacerbation rates and uh, and things like that. Um, you do sometimes get a shock. So, you know, we sometimes have done a CT scan um, and actually despite the lack of clinical deterioration, the CT scans got significantly worse. And in those cases, you really need to be having a look for, for why that may be. So checking the etiologies again, checking they haven't developed ABPA or that kind of thing, as I highlighted in, in, in my talk, or, or again, you know, really making sure that nothing new has grown. Leads to the next question that I would like to ask you. Uh, if the patient is not deteriorating and the CTs are stable, but occasionally you find that patient is growing pseudomonas in sputum, do you still recommend treating that infection? So yeah, certainly when we were doing the, the BTS guidelines and in fact the ERS guidelines, this was a topic that um, had quite a lot of... Uh, quite a lot of discussion around it and a lot of um, a lot of the decisions with regards to pseudomonas are based on um, cystic fibrosis where we know that if we eradicate pseudomonas um, then the outcome of patients is, is significantly better. We don't have that data in bronchiectasis, so we don't know that eradication leads to a improved clinical course. What, what we do know is that pseudomonas is related to increased mortality and is related to increased morbidity. And there's several studies which have shown that. Um, and hence, it does seem um, sensible to try and eradicate it. And that's something that's made its way into both guidelines and something that, that we do. So certainly if somebody, despite being well, had a first isolate of pseudomonas, um, I, then I would normally try and get rid of it with Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I oh. didn't hear the last few words, but oh, I sorry, got... sorry. I think I, I think I accidentally muted myself. <laughs> um, sorry. So what, what I was saying, um, I'm not sure at what point I muted myself. But if somebody was well and they had a new growth of pseudomonas, I would um, try and get rid of it. So I would normally give them ciprofloxacin, um, uh, 750 milligrams twice a day. Uh, for 14 days. Um, then if it was still present after that, then I'd have a discussion with the patients um, because after that, the kind of strategies I would think about would be intravenous antibiotics followed by nebulized colomycin. And obviously that's a significant burden of treatment. And um, I then discussed with a patient that, look, we don't know for certain that this will help your clinical course. And our success at this point in eradication um, is probably no more than 50 to 60%. So there I am a little bit more bespoke. So, you know, if somebody's 95 years old, lots of other comorbidities, um, I may, may not necessarily um, try and eradicate it. But for the most part, I would at least offer um, the opportunity for, for more, more in, intensive eradication. Thank you very much, Professor, for excellent lecture and very comprehensive answers. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, lecture for our audience. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I, was, I was in Sri Lanka doing this in, in person about, I don't know, five or 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm sorry I can't physically be with you, but hopefully again in the future. But good luck with the rest of the, the program. All right, we are looking forward for your presence here. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Now,
my next pleasant task is to introduce Dr. William Flight. Uh, he will be talking on uh, uh, on uh, tuberculous mycobacterial non-tuberculous mycobacterial pulmonary disease. The challenge of the diagnosis and treatment. Dr. William Flight uh, is a consultant in respiratory medicine at Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and is based at the John Redcliffe Hospital. He's the director of Oxford Adult Cystic Fibrosis Center and also has a specialist interest in bronchiectasis, non-tuberculous -micro non mycobacterial pulmonary disease and lung infection. Dr. William graduated from the University of Sheffield in 2002 and trained in respiratory and general internal medicine in Stoke in Trent, New Zealand and the Northwest of England. He spent three years as a clinical research fellow at Wyantashow Hospital during during which time he was awarded a PhD from the University of Manchester for research into the role of viral, viral respiratory infection in cystic fibrosis. He has, a, he has published on various aspects of respiratory medicine and lung infection and has ongoing research interest in the management of cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. Dr. William is a regional advisor to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh and maintains a strong interest in medical education. He's an educational supervisor to clinical medicine students at the University of Oxford, as well as to postgraduate trainees in respiratory medicine in Oxford. Uh, I hereby invite Professor William, Dr. Williams for his lecture. Dr. Williams, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. My name is William Flight. I'm a consultant respiratory physician in Oxford, based at the John Radcliffe Hospital. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about non tuberculous mycobacterial pulmonary disease. The contents of my talk are going to run through some background on the topic. Um, we'll cover the epidemiology and risk factors for NTM pulmonary disease and then discuss some of the challenges around clinical presentation, timing of treatment, and future um, research priorities in the area. So non tuberculous mycobacteria are considered to be ubiquitous in the environment. They're found out there in soil and water sources. And of course, they are acid fast bacilli when looked at in, in the laboratory. One of the problems with this area of um, my, microbiology is that the nomenclature varies uh, a great deal and different researchers have used um, variety of different terms, including atypical mycobacteria, environmental my mycobacteria, et cetera. And that can make um, it uh, challenging when interpreting the, the literature. These bugs uh, are capable of causing a variety of different clinical presentations. Um, and of course, in some cases, they're purely commensal and identification in say a respiratory sample doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, causing active disease. But these are the, the most common presentations of NTM infection. So one end of the spectrum disseminated disease can be seen in people who are heavily immunocompromised, for instance, in the setting of HIV infection. These bugs are certainly well recognized as causing skin and soft tissue joint infections. And they can also cause lymphadenitis, much the same way as tuberculosis can. But what we're going to focus on today is pulmonary, pulmonary disease. So um, infection of the lung and airways with this group of mycobacteria. And these pathogens have been described uh, over a long period. This article from back in the 1950s from Dr. Runyon based in the um, United States highlights the fact that non-tuberculous mycobacteria or anonymous mycobacteria as he termed them were certainly far from rare and um, cause problems both for the clinician and the microbiologist in terms of identifying them and managing the uh, resulting disease. In terms of the breakdown of mycobacteria, clearly mycobacterium tuberculosis um, causes a distinct uh, disease and presentation. Similarly, mycobacterium leprae causes leprosy, but the remaining um, mycobacteria typically clumped together into either rapid or slow-growing mycobacteria. And it's these pathogens that we're going to focus on in the rest of the talk. This phylogenetic tree shows the genetic relatedness of the various different mycobacterial species. You'll see at the, at the bottom, 
here, Mycobacterium avium complex, one of the slow growing mycobacteria. And in the light blue, you'll see the, the rapid growing mycobacteria, of which Mycobacterium abscessus is certainly the most common one that we encounter in, in clinical practice. Where do we find these um, mycobacteria? Well, they, as we mentioned earlier, they're typically found in soil water sources. The bottom right, you'll see a heater cooler system, which has been used in a um, variety of healthcare settings and was um, the source of a worldwide nosocomial outbreak of mycobacterium, mycobacterium chimera infection within recent years, highlighting potential issue of hospital um, transmission of these bugs. Given that these are environmental and found in, in water sources, it's unsurprising that the prevalence will, will vary um, according to the location of the, um, of the patient and the environment you're studying. So this map shows the United States and it seems to be hiring higher prevalence of mycobacteria in certain areas of the country, for instance, Florida, California, Hawaii, is just to make um, perhaps hot, humid climates are more um, favorable for these mycobacteria. We know from a number of studies that the um, prevalence of NTM pulmonary disease is rising over recent years. So this graph is taken from a study from Germany, but there is similar, uh, similar data from a variety of countries, including the USA, Scotland, and parts of Asia, um, to suggest that the disease is increasing in prevalence. And why might this be? Well, I don't, I don't think we know for certain um, what the cause of this is. Certainly there are number of possible explanations, for instance, increasing awareness or more, um, uh, more frequent testing, investigation for the disease, perhaps changes in antibacterial use or prevalence of TB in some countries may be related. Perhaps climate change is, is an issue, but I think there are many potential explanations, but we are yet to determine this with any degree of certainty. So, how does NTM pulmonary disease um, arise? I think this framework of thinking about it is helpful. You require um, sufficient pathogenicity of the mycobacterium itself to cause active disease. You need a conducive environment within, within the lungs, and this typically means a, um, an underlying lung disease, and also the susceptibility of the host in terms of their immune defense. So a combination of all of these three will um, give the potential for NTM pulmonary disease to become established. In terms of the pathogen, the different species within the Montrevecus mycobacteria um, have different degrees of pathogenicity. And some are more likely to cause active pulmonary disease than others. So for example, Mycobacterium kansasia or Mamoense will be much more likely to be clinically significant than, for example, Mycobacterium gordoni or Fulfurita, as shown here. These are certainly not hard and fast rules, and you certainly will encounter um, active infection with some of the species to the left of this graph. The breakdown of the different species causing NTM pulmonary disease varies um, in different countries, different parts of the world. And this just shows the difference between four European countries. You'll see in, in the UK, where I'm based, that um, rapid growing mycobacteria, for instance, mycobacterium abscess, abscessus, cause a, uh, a large minority of cases, where it's much lower in some of these other, other countries. I can't find any detailed breakdown for um, the different NTM species in Sri Lanka, but there are data from India, for instance, this. Um, the study looking at patients with suspected tuberculosis in Delhi um, found that of their patients who were, went on to be diagnosed with non tuberculous mycobacterial pulmonary disease, Mycobacterium intracellulari, abscesses, and Kansasia were the, were the three most common um, pathogens in their, in their cohort. So, looking at the conducive environment aspect of, of this, which conditions are um, associated with increased risk of NTM pulmonary disease. And there are many, including COPD, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, for example, 
and, and on a global scale, post tuberculous lung disease damage can um, certainly lead to subsequent NTM colonization. Various other risk factors have been investigated, and this table summarizes a number of different studies that have looked at risk factors for NTMPD. And what seems to come out fairly consistently is that bronchiectasis is uh, associated with very high increased risk of NTM pulmonary disease. Overall, there's variability between different studies, but um, there tends to be a prevalence of NTM pulmonary disease of around 9 or 10% in most studies um, looking at this. So how does multivirculous mycobacterial pulmonary disease present? Well, the two classical um, uh, forms of, of the condition. First, it's termed a nodular bronchiectatic pattern, which is associated with tree and bud modularity and CT scanning, bronchiectasis, and um, may often affect the middle lobe or, or lingual. Many studies have found a female predominance with this pattern of disease, and it can occur in people without pre existing lung disease, which leads to a chicken and egg phenomenon as to which comes first, the bronchiectasis or the NTM infection. The other pattern of disease um, is termed fibrocavitatory, which is associated with much more in the way of parenchymal destruction and cavitation, it tends to have an apical predominance and often follows a, a clinical course similar to, to TB. And this is important because there's clear evidence that fibrocavitatory presentations, certainly for mycobacterium avium complex disease, is associated with a poorer prognosis as shown in the um, Kaplan-Meier chart here. So the, the, that summarizes the, some of the typical presentations of NTM pulmonary disease, but it's important to have rigorous criteria to make the the diagnosis of active infection or active pulmonary disease. And the American Thoracic Society, ID Society of America guidelines published in 2007 have been accepted as the um, gold standard for diagnosis of this condition. So there are a number of criteria that are required to make diagnosis clinical. So you require uh, appropriate compatible pulmonary symptoms. There are radio radiological criteria um, as listed here. So presence of nod nodularity, cavities, multifocal bronchiectasis, uh, classical. Um, and it's also important to have excluded other diagnoses before this um, diagnosis of NTMPD. The final group of um, criteria are microbiological, which are, are listed here. So uh, a single one-off sputum culture positive for for mycobacteria would be insufficient to make a diagnosis of NTMPD, but multiple sputum samples or a bronchoalveolar lavage or biopsy features as listed here um, would meet the microbiological criteria. And the, these, um, these criteria have subsequently been adopted by other guidelines, including the British Thoracic Society. So how do we investigate um, a patient suspected of having multivocalous pulmonary disease? Um, this guy, guideline or this algorithm is taken from the British Thoracic Society guideline published a few years ago, um, which looks complicated, but it's fairly um, self-explanatory and allows you to work through the diagnostic algorithm. And that essentially boils down to sending multiple sputum samples for mycobacterial smear and culture um, to be analyzed alongside a high resolution CT scan of the chest to look at the radiological criteria. And if there's ongoing um, uncertainty or the patient's unable to produce sputum, then a bronchoscopy for bronchoalveolar lavage um, would be warranted. This will following this algorithm will hopefully allow you to determine whether the patient has active NTM pulmonary disease or not. So having made the diagnosis of NTM pulmonary disease before launching into specific treatment, I think it's important to try and get the, the basics right. So particularly in the patient in patients with bronchiectasis, airway clearance is absolutely essential. So ensuring that the sputum is moving and being cleared effectively with just physiotherapy input. Basics of long-term pulmonary disease management are, are also important. So physical activity, pulmonary rehabilitation would be um, recommended. Smoking cessation if the patient smokes as, alongside appropriate vaccinations to prevent um, uh, infectious diseases, 
certainly my parents would be looking to optimize and rationalize the medications. Is there any way of scaling back any form of immunosuppression, including inhaled use of inhaled steroids, which is limited evidence to support the use in bronchiectasis unless they have um, coexisting asthma or COPD. And nutritional support is, off, is also really important as these patients often have um, a history of weight loss and uh, cachexia um, in the run-up to their diagnosis. And then finally, we would certainly advocate uh, looking for other co-pathogens, for instance, Haemophilus influenzae or Pseudomonas serotonin, which may be more amenable to treatment than, than mycobacterial disease. So treatment of NTMPD is dependent on which organism or pathogen we're dealing with. Um, and given the number of potential NTMs that can, can cause infection, we don't have time to run through the, the recommended treatment uh, of each one, but we'll just focus on one of the most common mycobacterium avian complex. And this um, table is taken from the British Thoracic Society guideline, which is um, uh, fairly um, comparable with American guidelines. And the key, uh, the key um, take a message here is a combination antibiotic therapy using three drugs as a first line treatment is um, the, the gold standard. So typically for non-severe um, MAC pulmonary disease, um, recommendations would be for a three times a week regimen, including rifampicin, ifambutol, and macrolide. And my practice would certainly be to use azithromycin rather than clarithromycin as it seems to be better tolerated and has a greater evidence base in terms of the management of bronchiectasis for as an immunomodulatory agent. In more severe disease, for instance, with uh, cavitation, smear positivity, for example, you know, a once daily regime would be, um, would be advocated with the potential option of adding in either an intravenous or nebulized um, aminoglycoside, such as in my own case. As I said, the, um, the British Society Society guidelines give um, clear recommendations for the management of different NTM species. And there's a very useful pharmacopoeia at the back of the guideline, which gives you um, advice around dosing, side effects, drug monitoring for each of the uh, medications likely to be used in treatment of NTM. So that's the, the treatment. Uh, once the diagnosis has been made, but bef before you get to that point, it can be can be challenging sometimes to get the timing right of um, of when to start NTM treatment, and in some cases a more uh, watch and wait um, strategy may be more may be more appropriate. So, when deciding the, the optimal timing of starting NTM treatment, we need to think about uh, factors related to the patient themselves. So how severe is the disease? How rapidly is it progressing? What um, are the patient's comorbidities and or degree of frailty? It's the combination of multiple antibiotics over 12 or 18 months can be very difficult to tolerate in, in some cases, particularly in those with um, hearing problems, renal disease, etc. Patients themselves may well have uh, preference as to whether this is something that they could take on or whether they're the, um, the potential side effects might be worse than the, the, the disease itself. There are also, of course, the factors relating to the, the pathogen itself. So we, as we saw, some, some mycobacteria are more likely to cause active disease than others. Some patients will have infection with multiple, um, multiple different mycobacteria, and that can be uh, challenging sometimes coming up with the, um, the, the best combination of drugs. And this isn't something that is covered in detail in the various guidelines of availability that are available. And similarly, my, um, mycobacterial loads or whether patients smear positive or not can give you a, an idea of the, um, the urgency with which to start treatment. And I think the important is to consider what the goal of the treatment is. Are we aiming to cure the patient and um, resolve their, their pulmonary disease in, in total or are we more um, looking at quality of life and palliation of um, a frail comorbid patient it's difficult to be um, to give clear guidelines that cover each situation you may find yourself in with these with these pathogens so we'll turn now to some of what i would see as the 
um, main challenges in, in NT and pulmonary disease management. The first is how to manage refractory disease, by which we mean the, the failure of bacteria, or failure of the patient to culture convert after 12 months of combination guideline-based NTM therapy. There's limited evidence base for how to tackle this, for instance, in, in MAC, lung disease, but um, a number of different agents have been used as second-line therapy, including oxyfloxacin, clofazamine, and so on. And I think there's a lack of um, data to inform which of these should be um, should be the next step if somebody who's failed to culture and convert. Um, the BTS guidelines um, would suggest use of amikacin or either intravenous or nebulized, but again, the, the evidence base to back this up is somewhat limited. Perhaps the strongest evidence is um, around the use of nebulized liposomal amikacin, aricase which um, um, has been uh, studied both phase two and phase three um, with some promising results. So this shows the um, rate of uh, culture conversion in, in patients receiving nebulized liposome on a casein, shown in this line, compared with um, those who were, um, uh, just have a guideline-based therapy themselves. And you can see the, the greater rate of culture conversion, although it remains the minority. So this is a, um, an adverse pregnancy uh, sign if you have failed to, to culture convert with guideline-based therapy. Surgery may be considered in refractory disease. Um, again, this can be difficult. Selecting the, the optimal patient is likely to benefit from this. It tends to be people with um, more localized disease who are otherwise fit and um, adequate nutrition status that are likely to benefit. But again, the, the, the evidence is based on case series and um, it's still quite a degree of uncertainty. Drug resistance is a key issue um, in the management of NTM. This shows the um, antimicrobial susceptibility pattern for mycobacterium abscessus. I said from one of my patients and you'll see it seems it's resistant to many of the drugs that we we're able to test for. Um, it's hard to know what these results mean in terms of clinical practice and how likely a uh, patient is to respond to combination therapy despite this unpromising looking susceptibility result. We touched on the issues of toxicity earlier on, and this can be a real, um, real challenge, and it is often very difficult to make it through the full course of treatment without significant side effects. Um, nephrotoxicity with um, aminoglycosides can be a, a real issue, as can visual dissent with um, ethambutol, etc. So this is certainly not a benign course of treatment for many patients and um, can be a challenge to manage. Further issue that um, is of great importance is around coexistence of pathology. So, one, ex one example that can raise problems in the clinic is the, the, um, the phenotype of non tuberculous mycobacterial infection with Aspergillus lung disease. And this um, CT shows from my, is from one of my patients with um, coexisting abscessus, mycobacterium avium, and APPA. So, um, this data from Jakob van Ingen published in ERJ a couple of years ago showing that um, Aspergillus antibody. Levels of are high, you know, significant proportion of, of patients with NTM pulmonary disease. And management of this um, phenotype can be difficult with potential interactions between azole antifungals and um, standard NTM therapy regimes. This case also highlights um, the potential for other lung conditions to um, complicate management of NTM pulmonary disease. So, this is a patient who had both. Um, mycobacterium abscessus and previous mycobacterium avium infection on the background of COPD. And unfortunately, during follow-up, they developed a, um, a large white lung mass diagnosis of no carcinoma. The final um, issue that um, can has caused a lot of um, difficulties in the certainly within the cystic fibrosis field is the amount of potential for 
person-to-person -person transmission of mycobacterium abscessus. And before um, uh, data emerged from Seattle and Cambridge, suggesting that mycobacterium abscessus might be possible to, um, to be transmitted between patients, it was considered that NTM were, were not responsible for um, transmission between, between patients. They were just acquired um, from the environment. Um, the team at Papworth in Cambridge um, have uh, reported on the existence of clusters of mycobacterium abscessus within people with cystic fibrosis um, and suggested that this may be due to um, cross infection uh, within healthcare settings or potentially even involving um, healthcare workers looking after people with cystic fibrosis. Um, however, there are a number of studies that haven't found genetic evidence of um, cross infection in cohorts of mycobacterium abscessus infected uh, patients with CF. And most recently, our group in Oxford has um, linked uh, whole genome sequencing data for more than 2,000 mycobacterium abscessus isolates with detailed clinical and epidemiological data, both in cystic fibrosis and non cystic fibrosis patients. And we have not found uh, evidence to suggest that um, there is a major role for person-to-person -person transmission. We've found um, these clusters of mycobacterium abscessus um, are found across the across England and do not seem to be um, there doesn't seem to be a clear epidemiological link to suggest person-to-person um, uh, -person transmission. So it'd be interesting to see whether there are further studies um, in the future to, um, to try and clarify this issue um, with certainty. And then the final challenge, which we've, we've alluded to earlier, is around the, the, the state of the current evidence base for NTM disease. I think we've really benefited from the various national and international guidelines to help um, standardise treatment of NTM pulmonary disease. And some of this, these are shown here. Um, however, when we look at the grading of the evidence within these guidelines, for instance, the British Thoracic Society guideline in 2017, there was a, the vast majority of the recommendations were based on grade D, so expert opinion rather than rigorous um, studies. And I think this is, highlights that there is a real need for. Um, high quality evidence to, to um, help inform our management of this really challenging condition. So I think there are important research questions around NTM epidemiology and risk factors for disease. Um, there are, there's work to be done on the diagnostics and to allow, to allow rapid NTM identification. At the moment with culture-based um, methods, the delay in, um, in identifying particularly slow-growing mycobacteria can lead to significant delays in, in treatment. And then there's a real pressing need for um, high quality randomized control trials to, to inform the optimal treatment regimes, both up front with first line treatments and then in refractory disease. So, in summary, I've run through the um, clinical background and data on anti pulmonary disease, and I think. It's of concern that the prevalence of this condition appears to be increasing globally. We've benefited from the development of international guidelines on NTM pulmonary disease, but the treatment and the management and the diagnosis is often still very challenging. And I think there's an urgent need for us as a community within the NTM field to, um, to work together to enhance the evidence base on the management of NTM pulmonary disease. So, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much again to the organisers for the invitation to speak today. We're looking forward to the, hearing the rest of the talks and um, look forward to the um, opportunity to discuss with you in the, um, in the time after the, after the sessions. Many thanks. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams, for very comprehensive. Uh, uh, lecture elaborating on several points of uh, NTM infection. Uh, I think we will go for uh, questions at the end of uh, Dr. Dilesha Vadasinghas lecture at the end of sessions.
Dr. Dilesh Avadha Singh uh, is talking today on the bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka, benchmark to improve quality of care. Uh, Dr. Dilesh Avadha Singh is a consultant respiratory physician and lecturer at the Department of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, Ragama. She has, specialized, she has a specialist interest in bronchiectasis, sleep disordered breathing, and domiciliary non universal ventilation. Dilesh graduated from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalaniat in 2019 and passed her MD in medicine in 2015. She then underwent two years of local training in respiratory medicine at National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases, Sri Lanka, and underwent two years overseas training in respiratory medicine in UK. She was trained in sleep disordered breathing and domiciliary non-invasive ventilation services at the Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Trust, and then was fellow at the Adult Cystic Fibrosis and Bronchiectasis Unit at Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. Finally, she worked as a registrar in lung transplantation medicine at Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Trust, where she developed the inspiration to manage the failing lung. Upon returning to Sri Lanka, she has started performing and interpreting cardiopulmonary exercise testing and has developed a sleep and domiciliary NIV service attached to the faculty. Uh, Dilesha, it's over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, sir, for the very kind words of introduction. My talk will be focusing on bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka and how to improve quality of care. The purpose of this symposium is to trigger an interest in this common but neglected disease in Sri Lanka. I will be talking you through the very little data on bronchiectasis published so far in Sri Lanka with some comparison to regional data. And then we shall look at what can be done to improve services in terms of diagnosis, etiology, and management. So bronchiectasis, as I said before, is a common but long neglected disease in Sri Lanka, and it causes a substantial disease burden both to patients and the society. There are no specific data regarding hospital admission due to bronchiectasis available for Sri Lanka at present, but as shown here, it contributes to the third leading cause of hospital admissions, which is diseases of respiratory system, excluding diseases of upper respiratory tract, pneumonia, and influenza. The prevalence of bronchiectasis is increasing worldwide, and you would have known that by listening to the previous speakers. Uh, and therefore, bronchiectasis is gaining more academic and industry attention. This graph, which you have already show, uh, seen, uh, shows that the prevalence in UK is increasing and is about 500 per 100,000 population from a previously assumed figure of about 50 uh, per 100,000 population. Therefore, uh, it places a considerable burden uh, on healthcare with greater inpatient stay and annual cost per patient. So what do you think is the prevalence of bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka? Is it the same as in the developed world or is it higher or lower than that? Yes, so as well uh, said, the prevalence of bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka remains largely unknown. So we do not know what the real prevalence is. And also there is no comprehensive study on the prevalence of bronchiectasis carried out uh, so far in Sri Lanka. So this could be due to lack of specific symptoms or simple um, or accurate and non-invasive screening tests for the large scale population investigations. And also it, could con it, it would have contributed with a lack of uh, interest in bronchiectasis. So as well emphasized in Professor Lobinger's talk, uh, the first and foremost important step in management is to identify the underlying cause as the treatment would differ depending on it. There is only one small study done in central Sri Lanka looking at the etiology of bronchiectasis by Dr. Madhagidara and his 
team. And according to, the, uh, to them, the commonest identified etiology was past severe infection. And this finding, as you can see, seems it is in par with uh, Western statistics, uh, although the particular infection would differ. The commonest uh, infective cause identified in, our in this study was tuberculosis. A possible etiology was not identified in about 41% of patients, which may be due to the limited resources in our country. And when comparing this with the data from the Indian registry, we can see that tuberculosis is the commonest etiology for bronchiectasis in India, while it is not the case in our study. But since this is a very uh, small uh, study and with the sample size was quite small, about 85 numbers, this may not represent the true bronchiectasis population in Sri Lanka, and therefore we need further large scale studies uh, in future. So there is a, a, a huge proportion in whom we have failed to identify the cause due to uh, poor resources compared to the Indian data as well. There are no data on morbidity and mortality on bronchiectasis, but you can see that diseases of the respiratory system is the fourth leading cause of hospital deaths in Sri Lanka. Therefore, in order to improve quality of care, first and foremost, we need to assess the true prevalence, etiology, morbidity, mortal and mortality of bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka. This will give us better understanding of how it would differ from the developed countries and what different phenotypes of bronchiectasis are seen locally. Also, we need to carry out epidemiological studies that are designed to measure mild, moderate, uh, as well as severe disease, and also to represent the population uh, beyond large urban centers. There are two um, disease severity indexes which have gained attention recently, namely the bronchiectasis severity index and the FACED score. The bronchiectasis severity index is recommended by the uh, British Thoracic Society and is widely used. We should, when using these scores to assess our patients, we should not forget that these scores, the bronchiectasis and these NIA scores have been developed to assess uh, the severity of bronchiectasis in the developed countries. Therefore, we propose that uh, independent validation is required for Sri Lankan population. The most noticeable challenge encountered, we encounter in research and clinical practice uh, are the disease heterogeneity and the absence of standard standardized clinical radiological uh, definitions for bronchiectasis. Also, experts worldwide agree that they are the most important reasons for scarcity of positive findings in randomized controlled trials as well. And also there are no um, accepted definitions of the often used terms such as bacterial colonization or the important microbiological outcomes we use such as eradication. This international consensus published in the Lancet this year by uh, the International Task Force of Experts to which Professor Lobinger has contributed as well has managed to find answers to the previously mentioned challenges. And it provides criteria and definitions mainly for research, but also could be used for clinical practice. And this diagram for, from that consensus shows the flow chart to define um, clinically significant bronchiectasis proposed by them. <laughs> 
If a patient is um, at least, uh, has at least two or three symptoms, which are cough most days of the week, sputum production most days a week, or history of exacerbation and radiological evidence of, bronchi uh, of uh, bronchiectasis on CT, they are said to have clinically significant bronchiectasis. So currently we use the VTS guidelines for management of bronchiectasis. And now the question comes whether we should um, continue to use it or should we uh, develop one for ourselves? So in our opinion, in my opinion, we do need to develop guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka. And this could be useful for resource allocation and to guide the development of a comprehensive bronchiectasis service, initially targeting the tertiary hospitals throughout the country to uh, uh, provide care to the population in the whole country. And I will also take uh, this opportunity to commend the effort of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists for taking the initiative of developing various assemblies to look into guideline development and the bronchiectasis uh, guideline development is carried out by the ARVS assembly. Uh, so uh, if you remember the study on etiology by uh, Madhagadar et al, you would know that we were unable to identify a possible etiology in about 41% of our patients. This is probably and mostly due to the limited resources available in the state sector, which where the uh, pop population would receive free uh, treatment. Therefore, it is important to strengthen the laboratories in state sector, since most of the investigations mentioned here targeting the etiology are only available in private sector and are quite costly. And also, though, uh, though diagnosing bronchiectasis has become significantly easier with the increasing uh, increase of HRCT imaging, there is imbalance of allocation uh, of CT scanners in Sri Lanka, showing insufficiency in some regions and surplus in others. Therefore, patients, mainly in the rural areas, are not diagnosed promptly, promptly and accurately, leading to delayed intervention. So when talking about management, we cannot forget uh, the cold vicious cycle of infection and inflammation, which you have seen in Professor Lovingas, presentation as well. This will help you to understand the basis of various treatments used in bronchiectasis and to aim disruption of uh, this vicious cycle for successful management of your patient. In bronchiectasis, tissue damage due to various causes would lead to uh, impaired host defense, causing microbial infection, inflammation, and further tissue damage. Therefore, it is important for each patient to be assessed by the physiotherapist for airway clearance to provide solutions for the impaired uh, lung defense system. We see that majority of the bronchiectasis patients are not referred for airway clearance in Sri Lanka, and this was the same in Indian data as well as shown in, the, uh, in this diagram. So regular airway clearance would aid in preventing the number of exacerbations and give better quality of care. We know that most hospitals in Sri Lanka have physiotherapists who are trained in aiding airway clearance and their service has been used for inpatients, but its utilization for outpatients is poor. Therefore, we recommend that all bronchiectasis patients should be educated on airway clearance and to utilize the available airway clearance um, services. As Sri Lanka is a developing country, we do not see this range of equipment for airway clearance available in other countries. But amidst the poor resources, the physiotherapists have been creative enough to build their own bubble pep device with low cost and good results at the National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases, 
in Valisara, which is shown to in the right side of the screen. So please do refer your patient, bronchiectasis patients for airway clearance and encourage them to continue it regularly depending on the sputum volume to reduce exacerbations and for better quality of life. Another poorly utilized service is the pulmonary rehabilitation program, which is available at most respiratory uh, units throughout the country, where, uh, led by respiratory physicians. So if your patient is functionally limited by shortness of breath and feels breathless when hurrying or climbing a slight hill, they will benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation. Therefore, uh, we recommend that breathless bronchiectasis patients should be referred for pulmonary rehabilitation program. Uh, despite maximum treatment, a proportion of patients would progress to develop lung failure requiring home non-invasive ventilation and long-term oxygen. These are quite expensive treatment and unfortunately, the cost of the non-invasive ventilation and oxygen treatment as outpatient is not provided by the government. And it is a huge burden for the fi uh, financially poor subjects leading to more admissions with exacerbations and respiratory failure. Therefore, in order to improve quality of life for some, at least some of these patients, we have taken the initiative of starting a domiciliary non-invasive ventilation service at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania to support at least some of these underprivileged through lending and IV machines and managing their respiratory failure. I am happy and proud to say that we have already started the service and the website will be officially launched in the next few weeks. So in summary, there is very little published data on bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka and high quality research is needed to be carried out to generate evidence and guidelines and strengthening available services and utilizing them to improve quality of care is needed for a better bronchiectasis service in Sri Lanka, one day aiming to lung transplant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vadasingha, for very positive uh, lecture, which uh, encouraged all of us uh, regarding the current state of uh, tuberculosis uh, bronchiectasis in Sri Lanka. I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, uh, can I ask a question from Dr. Flight? Is he online? All right, thanks. Uh, Dr. Flight, thank you very much for your very comprehensive educational lecture. Uh, and uh, in your lecture, you mentioned that you look for the bacillary mycobacterial load in deciding treating these patients. Uh, what parameters do you use to assess the bacillary load in uh, those patients? Thank you. I, I think that's one of many um, factors that we might consider to weigh up the decision as to whether to start combination treatment or not. It's certainly not a major factor. We have in, in our routine clinical practice, um, we don't have particularly sophisticated ways of measuring that. But um, if we see a smear, see a smear positive um, result, so we can see the, my, the mycobacteria with direct microscopy, then that um, may indicate a higher mycobacterial load and may um, uh, be incorporated into the decision making practice. I think that's in terms of diagnostics. That's uh, an area that certainly needs greater um, uh, efforts that um, in future research studies. I think before we know for certain whether, whether the mycobacterial load really is a, a, an important um, parameter in making treatment decisions. Uh, regarding uh, the pathogenicity of the bac bacillus uh, uh, and uh, human to human transmission, uh, what 
what non uh, ntm uh, infection would you put on top is it uh, mycobacterium abscesses or uh, in uh, mycobacter uh, mac uh, mycobacteria other uh, avium complex uh, or, or any uh, other mycobacteria uh, can you yeah. answer that there's a, a great deal of variability in um, in in the uh, clinical significance for the individual species for any individual patient and the aggregate data gives you an overview but won't necessarily guide the the likely impact of an individual um, species for an individual patient but of, often in my practice um, there does seem to be a correlation often with the rapid growing mycobacteria often prove, um, prove more challenging to manage and um, often requiring very intensive induction therapy for example Mycobacterium abscessus, which is one of the most common of these species that we see in our in our practice, um, uh, certainly can lead to um, severe and rapidly progressive disease in some cases. Um, although we do also see patients who um, have repeated isolates of Mycobacterium abscessus in their sputum who are clinically well, and we haven't treated treated and are able to to monitor them and, and treat conservatively. So I think it is very variable. There's still a huge amount of uncertainty with the um, with these uh, these pathogens and, and the whole area. So it's difficult to, to give a clear, clear answer uh, right. in each situation. Right. Thank you, Dr. Flight. Uh, my next question goes to uh, Dr. Vada Singh. Uh, you, you, with your lecture, we saw there are a lot of efficiencies in the in the, uh, dealing with the bronchiectasis in our country. Uh, we, if you want to start uh, documenting data from grassroots level, what kind of information would you like to have uh, have in, on your table uh, to decide or plan for the future? Uh, before that, what kind of data do you want to collect from peripheries? So, um, thank you, sir, for the question. So, what we should do is, uh, so we should uh, first identify the severity, the, the how many patients are having bronchiectasis, whether those patients are confirmed, confirmed with CT or not. And then we'll have to identify whether the what what severity these patients are in, whether it's mild disease, moderate, or severe. And then to see whether uh, the etiology has been looked into, what are the underlying etiologies, because where the etiology seems to differ from the Indian data, from the uh, data in the uh, uh, in the uh, developed countries in UK. So uh, when we should look at the etiology and see whether we can offer the all or offer um, all patients the a standardized set of tests to these patients. Um, that that is actually to allocate the health resources for these patients. And then when coming to management, airway clearance, pulmonary rehabilitation are. Uh, some important treatment modalities which we can provide with low resources. So are those patients um, needing airway clearance uh, assessment? Are they needing formal rehabilitation and what percentage is uh, receiving it and uh, whether we can improve their services is something else or what we, we should look into as well. And then again, so we, we can uh, see, see whether these patients need um, NIV oxygen treatment once they are gradually deteriorating annually uh, with, with maybe annual reviews at a specialized center and to be managed in the peripheral centers uh, monthly or whatever the requirement usually is. Like that that leads to my next question. What what criteria do you want to uh, select a patient for home in NIV? Uh, supposing we get a bronchiectasis patient, do you have any special criteria to decide on this patient is going for NIV? Um, so that is an area where there is very little research and very little guidelines on even in uh, in even internationally. But then the guidelines what we use for bronchial the COPD patients are what we usually use. So if your patient with bronchiectasis is coming in with an exacerbation, acute exacerbation, needing NIV at least two times, then we should um, 
offer them an assessment to see whether they need domiciliary NIV. And also, if they are blood gas, they are hypoxic uh, with the saturation maybe less than 92, assessed with the blood gas. And if they are persistently in type 2 respiratory failure, such patients would benefit from being started on uh, non invasive ventilation. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vadisinga, for excellent lecture. And I thank all three speakers. And we have, I think, the uh, listeners have gained a lot from this session. And it was a very useful uh, for all us who are practicing uh, respiratory medicine in the country. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presence. Thank you.